uh, so you're all here solving problems. Um, what mathematicians like to do after they solve a problem, and I think what, in a way, the field of mathematics thrives on is solving a problem more than once. Because the first time we solve it, then we know it's true. But the second time, and the third time, and the fourth time we solve it, then we start to really understand why it's true and understand how deep the connections go. Um, a great example of this is something like the Pythagorean theorem, which in the last 2,500 years or so has been solved with about 400 independent proofs or so. People have come back to that over and over again and seen why it's true in different ways. This somehow is what mathematicians love more than anything else. This is like the holy grail of mathematics, is connecting these areas that seem like they have nothing to do with each other, and yet are two sides of the same coin. So I want to show you what I think of as one of the most beautiful examples of this today, with a mathematical object known as Sierpinski's triangle. Um, and some of you know what that is. That's great. Hopefully you'll see something new about it. Uh, I'm going to show you four really what I think of as remarkably different ways to build Sierpinski's triangle, and, um, and then talk about some of the connections that come out of this, which are just stunning, I think. So, what is Sierpinski's triangle? Well, it looks like this. Uh, it is this, it's a fractal shape. It's somehow infinitely self-similar. So if you zoom in on one of those little corner triangles, it looks exactly like the whole shape again. It goes down infinitely. Um, so a really interesting mathematical model or object in its own right. Um, the first way to make this, in kind of the classical way, is uh, what I kind of think of as the iterated carving method. Sort of, we're going to carve things out of it over and over again. Um, start with a triangle, and just connect the midpoints of the triangle, and cut out the triangle out of the middle, giving us three smaller triangles on the, on the side. So that's our first stage. OK, well now, is, once we've done that, We've got three new triangles that look just like the original one we started with. So we can repeat the process for each one of those and cut a triangle out of each of those. Well, great. But why stop there? As, as soon as we've got, now we have nine triangles that all look like the original one except smaller. Let's cut triangles out of each of those. OK. Well, now there's 27 triangles. Let's cut triangles out of each one of those. And then let's cut triangles out of each one of those. And let's cut triangles out of each one of those and just go on forever. And Sierpinski's triangle is what we get when we repeat this process to the limit. We, we go to the infinity of stage. That's Sierpinski's triangle. It's a really fascinating object. For example, you can ask, I wonder what the area of this thing is, the final stage of that. That's a really fun question to think about. Or I wonder what the perimeter, the boundary, if you could include all the inner and outer boundaries, what, what would that be? Well, you can work this out on your own. And, and some folks might know it already. I saw a hand go up over here. Do you know what the area? The area would just be zero. Yeah, it turns out that this thing in the limit, the final Sierpinski triangle shape, has zero area. And even weirder, it has infinite perimeter. So already, just in the first building of this thing, we've got this totally bizarre behavior that it somehow takes up no space and yet has an infinite boundary. So OK, that's cool, and that's fine. So uh, you know, if we just did that, we'd already be pretty happy. But that's not where a mathematician stops. A mathematician is going to come back and do this again in a totally different way and see what happens. So the second method I want to show you, and this is where it starts getting really interesting, uh, is using a, a method called L systems. So L systems are essentially a system of rules that grow from a seed. Um, so my favorite sort of silly example is um, an AAP phenomenon. I don't know if you've heard of an AAP phenomenon. You need to know what the AAP stands for. Um, AAP stands for an AAP phenomenon. So if I want to expand out that acronym, well, I can start at stage zero, my seed stage, with AAP. I expand out the acronym, it's an AAP phenomenon. Now I go to the next stage and expand that out. It's an, an AAP phenomenon phenomenon. Expand out the next stage, and an and AAP phenomenon phenomenon phenomenon. And I can keep doing this forever, and I can get sort of longer and longer strings of these things until I get, again, to the infinity of stage, I'm at the limiting stage. Um, so this is just a little bit of a silly example. Uh, 
But it actually becomes really interesting when we let those, we let the seed stand for something geometric and the pieces stand for something geometric. So here's a little bit more of a sophisticated example. I'm going to have two symbols, A and B, which both mean draw a line forward a certain distance. I'm going to have two other symbols, a plus and a minus, which mean turn left or turn right 60 degrees. And I'm going to have two rules for how the seed grows. And one of the rules is that A, in the next stage, every time I see an A, I'll replace it with B minus A minus B. And every time I see a B, it turns into A plus B plus A. Right now, this is totally formal. I'm just kind of moving symbols around. So I start with A. In my next stage, well, I have a rule for what A turns into. It turns into B minus A minus B. That's fine. And now I go to the next stage. Well, I just use my rules, and I say, well, B turns into A plus B plus A, and then the minus sign doesn't change, and then I have the A turns into B minus A minus B, and the minus sign doesn't change, and then I have A plus B plus uh, A, A plus B plus A again. So I just expand this thing out, just like I did with an AAP phenomenon. Um, and it can keep going forever, right? This is going to keep getting longer and longer. Now, again, it doesn't seem like it means very much yet, but remember, this actually is drawing instructions. So the first stage is just says, hey, just draw a straight line a certain distance and stop. Uh, by the time I get to stage two, this is a relatively, I mean, relatively complicated, but not too bad. And I can draw it, and you can try this out on your own, or you can take my word for it, but that's what it looks like. You know, I have some 60 degree turns that change direction. I get something like that. Okay, let's say I skip a few more stages forward. Here's what it looks like at stage four. It's pretty cool, right? Every time I have a straight line, when I go two stages forward, it turns into that shape from the last slide. This, every straight line is replaced by this. So then I get that. Now I'm going to skip forward a couple more stages. I'll get something like that. And then, and this is kind of mind-blowing, right? And I go two more stages forward, and I get that. So this is just stage eight, and we can already see what's happening here. It turns out that this L system gives you back Sierpinski's triangle. Crazy, right? And not only is it cool, and now we've, now we've done it two ways, but think about the implications of this. Now that I've built it in two different ways, there is a question staring us in the face. The first way I did it, I started with a, a triangle, a two-dimensional object, and I cut triangles out of it, right? You would imagine that if I started with a two-dimensional thing, and cut some things out of it, I would end up with a two-dimensional thing, right? But this time, I started with a line, which is a one-dimensional thing, and I've only been adding lines, which seems to suggest that Sierpinski's triangle is one-dimensional. So I have a real conundrum on my plate. Is Sierpinski's triangle one-dimensional or two-dimensional? Now, I wouldn't have even thought to ask that question if I hadn't built the thing in two different ways. But the fact that I've done it twice now puts me in totally new territory, and it gives me a great question. And, I mean, I don't even know how many things you've ever even thought to ask this about. Generally, if you have a two-dimensional thing, you know what that is, right? It's a square. It's two-dimensional. It's a line or a perimeter of a circle or some circumference. It's one-dimensional. What do we even have to check if something is one-dimensional or two-dimensional? So it, it, this requires us now to consider our deeply held beliefs about what dimension even means. Um, and actually, to figure this out, we're going to need another way to think about dimension, or at least to check what dimension something is. Does anyone have any ideas how you can check what dimension something is? Yeah. Um, see how many ways you can measure it. See how many ways you can measure it. Like, like what do you mean? Yeah, that's right. So. So there's Sierpinski's triangle. I could sort of say, well, what do I need to measure this? I mean, it looks like I, mean, it looks like I need height and width, so maybe, that, maybe it's two-dimensional. On the other hand, it did come from lines. I mean, I, mean, I don't know, right? Yeah? That's a point. Yeah, maybe, there's, maybe the connection, so you're saying a two-dimensional figure is just an infinite amount of lines. Maybe, maybe our distinction between one and two-dimensional isn't so isn't so hard and fast as we thought. Um, I, there's a, a, yeah, another thought? This is exactly what I'm going to do.